Infiltration FN is a sequence of subsigma algebras and that is increasing. So this is a sequence of subsigma, uh, increasing sigma, increasing family of subsigma algebras. So this is a sequence of subsigma algebras and that and it is increasing. So Fn is containing an Fn plus one. So roughly speaking, this says that this says that Fn is all the information we know by time n, and Fn plus one is all the information we know by time n plus one. So this is an increasing sequence because as time passes by we have more and more information. So a filtration is just an increasing family of subsigma algebras. And then we have a sequence of random variable axiom. So this is a sequence of random variable. And we say that this sequence of random variable is adapted to this filtration. is adapted to this filtration it means that for any n, the random variable Fn is measurable with respect to Fn. So the idea of this sentence says, Fn is all the information we know by time n. And this Xn is just the information, uh, 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 is a random variable that we know it by time n. Okay. So usually, when we consider, uh, so usually, it's for most part of the uh, of the of my lecture, we usually take Fn generated by but natural the natural gener uh, natural filtration with respect to this sequence of random variable. So the natural filtration is for any n Fn. It's just uh, everything. It's the sigma algebra of all the random variable up to time n. So usually we have a sequence of random variable, and the filtration is the way we usually choose the natural filtration of this sequence of random variable. So the natural filtration is up to time n. It is all the information that the random variable can give us by time n. So a filtration is just an increasing family of subsigma algebras. And usually we consider it, uh, the natural filtration of a sequence of random variable. And then we can introduce what is a martingale. So a sequence of random variable accent is a martingale. If if this relation holds for any n greater than m, so it says that this is a sequence of x n, and the f m is all the information we know by time m. And now we want to calculate conditional expectation of Xn given all the information of uh, up to m. Then this conditional expectation is the same as Xn. So this is a martingale. Uh, throughout my lecture, I will write martingale as this one. OK. And we also define a two related notion. One is called super martingale and a sub martingale. So a super martingale, if it is the last sign here, and a sub martingale, if it is greater sign here. Okay, so this is a martingale, and the rough idea is uh, if we want to predict what happens at time n, given all the information 
that to a previous time, then this, this is the same as the information we can get at time n. Okay, three examples of martingale. So suppose we have a sequence of xi, they are i, i, d. And they have expectation zero. And then we define xn is the summation from time one to n. So this is a sequence of random variable. And then we can check that this sequence of random variable is a martingale. So in order to check it is a martingale, we only need to check it satisfy the relation here. So what we know is, uh, of course, usually we choose the filtration as the natural filtration generated by the sequence of random variable. So now our filtration fn is all the information of kc up to time n. And we need to check that, we need to prove that The conditional expectation of xn given fm equals xm. So why this is true? We need to study what's the uh, relation between this xn and this filtration fm. So what is xn? xn is the summation of kz1 to kzn. And this fm is all the information up to time m. So from the summation here, we know that the first m term is already contained in the information here. So the first uh, m term here is contained in this filtration. We already know what happens to them. So when we take ex condition expectation, we can, they are just uh, equals themselves. So by linearity, we know that this condition expectation can be written as two parts. This is the first part, and this is the second part. For the first part, kzn plus uh, a summation from one to m. This is already contained in the information of fm, so it, because we know everything up to time m. So this is exactly, this is just equals the quantity themselves. Okay, so this is the first part. And now let us check the second part. For the second part, this fm is all the information of from kc1 to kcm. But we know that kcm plus 1 uh, to n, so this quantity is independent of what happens for the time before m. So this guy is, and this guy, they are independent. And since they are independent, if we calculate the conditional expectation, it is the same as the expectation itself. So this is the second part. And for the second part, we can just take expectation one by one, and this equals zero. So the second part, finally, to equal zero. And this is the first part. And we check that this is exactly the same as xm. So the sequence of xn is a martingale. Okay, so this is the first example. 
Second example is very similar, just we change summation to product. So now we have a sequence of random variable. They are iid and has expectation equals 1. And now we define xm as the product of the sequence starting from 1 to m. And the conclusion is this sequence of random variable is also a martingale. So in the same way as before, we define a natural filtration. And the only thing is we need to check us So we need to check whether the conditional expectation of Xn given all the information up to time m equals Xn. So this is the thing we need to check. So now let us check what is Xn, what's the relation with respect to Fn. <clears throat> so now Xn, it is the product from 1 to m. And then we can split this product into two parts. First is the product from 1 to m. And then the product from m plus 1 to m. And when we calculate the conditional expectation, we know that this part is already containing the information here. So by taking out what is known, we can take this part outside. So by taking out what is known, we can take this part outside. And then let us look at the second part. For the second part, this is the product from m plus 1 to m. And this is the information up to time m. And we know that this guy is independent of what happens before time m. So these two, they are independent. And since they are independent, the condition expectation is the same as ordinary expectation. And for this ordinary expectation, we know that because this sequence is iid, so the product, first product and then expectation equals the first expectation and then product. So we can exchange the order of these two. And we know that for each random variable, the expectation is 1. So the, pro the, second, the product in the second part equals 1. And what we have is, This just equals the, the condition expectation just equals the first part. And the first part is exactly the same as Xm. Okay, so this sequence of products is also a martingale. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we need a more powerful taking out what is known for this one, right? Yeah, so in fact, we need to assume this uh, sequence of ID is either no negative or bounded. And then this is enough to using this taking out what is known. Yeah, we need some uh, regularity restriction on this sequence of random variable. Okay, so this is second example. And then the third example. In third example, we will see martingale, super martingale, and sub martingale in the same example. So in fact, what we consider is uh, buyers the gambler's room. So for gambler's room, or uh, it is the same as the simple random walker in Z, Z, Z1. So it means that we start from some point, and then for each step, we jump to the we jump to the left or jump to the right with probability. And in buyers the gambler's room, it means that at each step, 
we get a plus one with probability p, and we get a minus one with probability one minus p. This is a biased uh, gambler's run. So if p equals one half, then this is just a, a symmetric gambler's run. Okay, and in this uh, example, we get a sequence of accents. So in the first part of our lecture, this is a Markov chain with certain transition matrix. And here in this model, I will also tell you that in fact, it is also a martingale according to different parameter of P, it corresponds to martingale, super martingale, sub martingale. Okay, so for this gambler's rune, we know it is a martingale, and now I will tell you that in fact it is, a, uh, we know it is a mark of chain, and in fact it is also a martingale. So, in this gambler's rune, in fact we can construct this gambler's rune in another way. So consider we have a sequence of iid random variable, and this sequence is zi equals plus one, equals probability p, and you can see i equals minus 1, equals probability 1 minus p, and then we define xm as the summation from 1 to n of c i, and we can easily check this is exactly the same model as our gambler's room. And from the first example, we already see that if p equals one half, then the expectation of each guy of each step is zero. So by the first example, we know that this sequence of random variable is a martingale. And if p is not one half, so if we have a biased random variable, biased gambler's theorem then let us check what is the sequence xn. So to say it is a super martingale or sub martingale, we need to calculate the conditional expectation of xn given all the information up to fm. So we need to check what is the relation between this conditional expectation and, uh, uh, and the xm. So which relation here? And now we can repeat a similar idea we split this summation to two parts. Then we know that it equals it equals these two parts. And for the first part, because it is already known in this FM, it, it equals itself. And this is for the second part. And for the second part, again, we know that this guy is independent of this FM. So it is independent of what happens before time m. So when we, take, when we calculate the conditional expectation, it is the same as just the ordinary expectation. And then for this ordinary expectation, we can switch the order of the expectation of summation. And here for the expectation of the i, then it depends on p. So 
So the expectation of each random variable is 2p minus 1. And we have n minus m of them. And here we see that if p is greater than 1 half, uh, OK, and for this part, it is exactly like xm. So here we see that the conditional expectation equals xm plus the constant. And clearly, if p is greater than 1 half, we have that the conditional expectation is greater than xm. So we are in the sub Martingo case, right? Greater sub, right? And if p is less than 1 half, then we are in the super Martingo case. Okay, so here we see that for the for the gamblers room, according to different parameters, it corresponds to martingale or super martingale or sub martingale. And the last uh, item, I will tell you that even though for p is not one half, we know that this sequence x n is not martingale, but it is not far from a martingale. So if we normalize the sequence by a sequence of t depending on time, we again obtain a martingale. So for general p, if we define mu as the expectation of each random variable, so mu is 2p minus 1, and then we define a new sequence, yn, it is xn normalized by n times mu. And then this yn is again a martingale. So we can uh, quickly check. So the conditional expectation of yn given fm So n mu is just a constant, so we can take it out when we calculate the conditional expectation. And for the conditional expectation of xm given fm, by the calculation here, we know that it equals xm plus n minus m mu minus n mu. And we rearrange this term. So the conditional expectation of yn equals uh, ym. So this item tells us even though when p is not symmetric, xn is not a martingale, but it's not far from a martingale. If we normalize this sequence, then we again get a martingale. OK, so this is uh, basic examples of martingales. Is there any question? Okay, then we can turn to the, some basic properties of martingale. So first, if xn is a martingale, so just uh, I, I write down the definition of martingale somewhere, maybe here. remember which one is super and which one is sub. Okay, so this is the definition for martingale, super martingale, and the sub martingale. So this is a, random, a sequence of random variables satisfy this relation. Here we say that if we take expectation to both sides, then this relation tells us the expectation of xm equals the expectation of xm. So for a martingale, clearly we already have that the expectation is a constant sequence. Right? And for super martingale, so it's just we take expectation to both sides of this relation here, and this tells us this for the super martingale, the sequence of expectation is decreasing. 
And for some martingale, the sequence of expectation is increasing. So this is just some basic property. And then another basic property is we can change a martingale to a sub martingale by composition of a convex function. So suppose we have a mart sequence of martingale. And the phi is a convex function. Then phi xn is a sub martingale. Of course, this is true because we have Jensen's inequality for conditional expectation. So why this is true? We know that xn is a martingale, and we want to compose this martingale with a convex function. To check that this sequence is a sub martingale, we need to check that this sequence satisfy uh, this equation. So we need to check what is the conditional expectation of phi xm given all the information of fm. And then by Jensen's inequality for conditional expectation, we know that this guy is greater than First, take condition expectation and then compose with uh, this convex function. And since xn is a martingale, we know that this condition expectation equals xn. So here we check that for this new sequence, the condition expectation is greater than the sequence at time n. So this tells us phi xn is a sub martingale. Okay, so some basic property of martingales. And then we turn to the next notion, what is a stopping time? In fact, when we discuss uh, uh, Markov chain, we already, in, uh, we already attack what is the notion of stopping time. We just give the, the name of stopping time. So what is a stopping time? To consider a stopping time, first we need to have a filtration. So Fn is a sequence, an increasing sequence of uh, sub-sigma algebras. And we can imagine that this Fn just means all the information we know by time n. A stopping time is a random variable. Okay, so stopping time t is a random variable taking value in integer numbers and it satisfies the following pro property. So it means that for any event, for any n, the event that t equals n is containing fn. So this is the definition of a stopping time. So it is a random variable with the following two following properties. It means that for any n, this event is containing an fn. So roughly speaking, this tells us for this random variable t, in order to know what happens to this t, we only need to know what happens up to time n. So for any n, if we have, hmm, how to say? So if we know, uh, if we want to check what is the event that t equals n, then we only need to know all the information after time n. We don't need to know future information. So roughly speaking, a stopping time is a real stopping time in our real life. So if we want to check what is this event, we only need to know what happens by time n and we don't need to know what happens in the future. Okay, stopping time, some basic property for stopping time. First, just a several equivalent definition of stopping time. So this is the definition for stopping time. A stopping time is the random variable such that t <coughs> equals n is containing fn for all n. And here it just gives three other equivalent conditions to define a stopping time. So these four conditions are equivalent. First, t equals n is containing fn for all n. Second, t less than n 
is containing an FM. So this lemma says this four conditions are equivalent. This also tells us, this is first one is the definition of stopping time. And this lemma also tells us, in fact, these three uh, conditions are the same. So they, they can all wield as the definition of stopping time. So why these four conditions are equivalent? So we just approved by a, uh, by a cyclic in the cyclic order. So first implies the second. Suppose uh, we, we have the first condition for, for this random variable t. And then we need to check what is the event for t less than n. So for t less than n, it can be decomposed into i from 1 to n of t equals i. And for each guy, we know that T equals I is a measure is containing an FI. This is by first condition. And since our filtration is an increasing subsigma algebra, so FI is containing an FM. So this tells us for each I, T equals I is containing an FM. Now of course the union of all of them is also containing an FM. So this tells us first condition implies the second. OK, and then second in, implies the third. This is easier because we know that t greater than n is just a complement of t less than n. And since t less than n is contained in this filtration fn, and its complement is also complete in this fn. So, the third, so this shows that the second condition implies the third. And then, how to go from the third to the fourth? So in fact, from the third to the fourth, we just uh, change the notation from n to n minus one. So because we know that t greater than n, t only take value in integer number, so t greater or equals n, equals t greater than n minus one. And from the third condition, we know that this is con containing f and minus one. Okay, so this shows third implies fourth. And finally, fourth implies the first. So suppose we know fourth and how to get first. So first, the first one condition is t equals n. And t equals n is the difference between t greater than n and t greater than n plus 1. And for t greater than n, it is containing f n minus 1. And of course, it is also containing f n. And this event is also containing f n. So the difference of this two is also containing f n. OK, so this shows that these four conditions are equivalent. So in order, so later part of the lecture, if we have a time t, in order to check it is a stopping time, we, we, can, we can check either one of them, because they are all equivalent. Mm Okay, so the second lemma, some basic property about uh, operate, how we oper play with all this stopping time. So suppose we have two stopping time. And then this lemma says, 
So as t as thousand times, then the max of the two or the minimum of the two, they are also stopping time. And if we have a sequence of stopping time, so this is a sequence of stopping times, then the minimum of all of them and the sup of all of them is also a stopping time. These are also stopping time. Or we can take limit inf and limit soup. They are also stopping times. OK, so why this is true? For the first. Uh, I only check the max of the two, and you can you can prove the minimum of the two in a similar way. So why the max of the two is also a stopping time? So in order to check this new time as a stopping time, we only need to check whether this event is measurable with respect to f n. So the max of the two is less than n. It means that both of them are less than n. And since S is a stopping time, we know that this guy is containing Fn. T is a stopping time, so this guy is also containing Fn. And the intersection of the, of the two is also containing Fn. So this shows that the max of the two is also a stopping time. OK, so inf of all this sequence is also a stopping time. So in order to check. The inf of all this stopping time is, a, is a, the inf of all this sequence of the stopping time is a stopping time. We only need to check what is the event of it less than n. So just to re recall that this tj only take value in integer number. So the inf of the sequence of tj is less than n. This means that there must exist one is less than n. So the inf of them is less than n. It implies that this is equivalent to say that at least one of them is less than n. And then for each event here, tj less than n. So tj is a stopping time. So tj less than n is containing an fn. And then countable union of them is also containing an fn. So this shows that the inf of the sequence is, is a stopping time. And finally, about the limit, limit inf. So for limit inf, so what is this event? So the limit inf of tj is less than n. It means that so for so it's it just means that there is a sequence to it goes to infinity such that tj tj less than n and if we change it to intersection and the union of uh, events it will become this one so for this guy it means that there is at least one after m such that tj is less than n and it will intersect over, over all m this means that there is an infinite sequence such that tj is less than n so they are the same event and again for each event here it is containing fn the union is containing Fn, and the intersection is also containing Fn. So this shows that the limit inf of this stopping of a sequence of stopping time is also a stopping time. Okay, so this is the notion of stopping time. Uh, okay, before we turn to the next page, just a quick remark. So when we study the discrete time Markov chain, so when we consider the Markov chain, in the first lecture, so it has a sequence of random variable, 
and then we can define the natural filtration. And in the, first, in the second lecture, we will construct the stationary distribution. We define two special time. One is called the heating time, and another one is called first return time. So this is the heating time. And this is the first return time. And here we, we can check that both of them are stopping time. So for example, for the heating time, Tx is the first time that, that the sequence of x and hit x. So suppose we know that. So now let us check what is the event of tau x less than n. So tau x less than n, it means that before n, we already hit x. So of course, this event only needs the information after time n. It doesn't need the information in the future part. So this is contained in the natural filtration, fn. And this tells us, in fact, we already um, meet stopping times in you know, our first part, just that we didn't give it, give it the name. In fact, this heating time and the first return time, they are, they are both stopping times. OK, stopping time. And then we can we go to the what is the relation of stopping time of, and this sequence of random variables. So roughly speaking, the stopping time is something that if we know t is less than n, then it is only we only need to know the information after time n, and we don't need to know the future information. And now I want to introduce another notion. It's called. Uh, Ft. So for if we have a filtration Fn, we know that this Fn can be viewed as the information of all the information after time n. And then suppose that this is a filtration and T is a stopping time with respect to this filtration. And now I define Ft. This Ft is a new sigma algebra. And what is the, and the intuitive idea of this Ft is it tells us all the information up to time t. So when this index is n, Fn corresponds to all the information up to time n. And this Ft, roughly speaking, it is all the information up to this, up to this stopping time. So the precise definition of this Ft is it is all the event such that such that a intersect of stopping time less than n is containing fn. So, in fact, this guy is not very far from all uh, from from. T so, for any n, we know that. A intersect of this event is containing Fn. So A intersect of T less than N, it is contained, it, we, in order to know what, it, what is this, we only need to know the information after time N. So roughly speaking, intuit uh, so intuitively, this Ft is exactly all the information after time T. OK, and we can also easily check that if t is a constant, so it equals a constant integer, then the corresponding definition of ft equals fn0. So it is consistent with our intuition. If t is a constant, then this information after time t is just the information after time n0. And the second remark, we have a sequence of random variables. And now, t is a stopping time. So t is some random, va random variable, but taking value in integer number. Then xt is also a, ra a random variable. And then this xt is measurable with respect to ft. So this is consistent with our intuition. So for this sequence of random variable, if we stop at stopping time, 
of course, this guy is containing uh, is containing all the information up to stopping time up to the this stopping time. So this is also consistent with our intuition. And the last uh, item is if we have two stopping times. So two stopping time. As is always smaller than t, then we know that fs is containing ft. So before we prove this uh, remark, the intuitive idea is s is some some time before t, and fs is all the information up to time s, and of course this information is containing all the information up to time t because we know that this guy happens before this guy. So this is the intuitive idea. And now I will give a precise proof. So why this FF, FS is containing FT? So this sigma algebra is containing this guy. We only need to check that for any event A in FS, we want to check, we want to prove that it is also containing FT. So why this is true? So first, a is containing Fs. By definition of Fs, we know that F intersect of S less than N is containing Fn for all N. So this is the definition of Fs. And then we need to check what is the relation between this event and A intersect with T less than N, T less than N. So what's the relation between S less than n and t less than n. We know that S is always less than t. So this event can be decomposed into two parts. t is less than n. Or S less than n, but t is greater than n. So this is a disjoint union. And then we intersect with both, uh, both sides uh, with the equation A. So here, it just intersect both sides with equation A. And what we know is, this event is containing Fn. And this event is containing Fn. And since t is a stopping time, t greater than n is containing Fn. So the intersection of these two is containing Fn. And here we also see that the left hand side equals the union of these two, but these two unions are disjoint union. So this guy equals this one minus this one. And since this guy is containing Fn, and this one is also containing Fn, the difference of the two is also containing Fn. So this, is, this implies that this event is containing Fn. This is true for any n. So this tail is A is in Ft. And this shows that Fs is smaller than Ft. And this is also consistent with our intuition. So we stop at an earlier time, then the information we get is less than, this, uh, than what we can get uh, when we stop at a later time. Okay, so this is about stopping time. And now we compose Martingale with the stopping time. Okay, so suppose that Xn is a sequence of random variable and that it is a it is a martingale. And now t is the stopping time.
we define a new sequence of random variable and we denote it by, so this is x, and we define a new sequence of random variable. And this new sequence is defined by And uh, so this x t n is defined in this way. So this is this means that the smaller one between n and t. So this index is random, and this x at, at a random index is our new sequence of random variable. And we I I call it as truncated martingale because we in fact we stop this martingale at the, at the stopping time t. So before suppose we know what is this t. Then before time t, this sequence is the same as the sequence of martingale. But after time t, it just stops at x t and stay there forever. So it is a truncated at the stopping time. And for this new sequence, first we can check that this new sequence is still integrable. So for every vertex, for any one, it is, this guy is still has finite expectation. Why this is true? So why it still have finite expectation? And of course, this is less than summation from one to n of x i. And then we know that this guy is less than the summation of one to n of this one. So this is just a finite summation. So of course, it is still finite. So the new sequence of random variables is still integrable. Second, this new sequence of, of random variables is still adapted to the filtration, to the arrangement of filtration. So Fnt is still Fn measurable for any n. Why this is true? So what is Fnt? Xn t is Xn sub t. So we know that if we decompose what happens to t, we can write this random variable in another way. So we just decompose of what happens to the stopping time t. If t equals i when i is less than n, we know that this guy equals xi. And if t is greater than n, then it's, it is xn. And for the expression in the right-hand side, we know that this event is containing fi. xi is containing fi. So the product of the two is containing fi. So of course, it is also containing fn. So it is fn measurable. And for this part, this is xn t greater than n is containing fn. So this one is also containing fn. So this tells us this x and t is also fn measurable. So this is a new, pro this new process is still uh, integral and adapted. And finally, the conclusion is, in fact, this new process is still a martingale. So x t is a still a martingale. And then why this is true? So in order to check this is, it is still a martingale, we need to check what's the conditional expectation of of x n given f n minus one. So if we can show that this guy equals x n minus one stopped at the t, then for smaller m, we can also check by t by tower law. So it is sufficient to check that. Uh, this is true. Okay, so it is sufficient to show that this condition expectation equals n minus one. And for smaller m, we can just uh, prove by uh, tower property. So we only need to check what's the 
relation between the two neighbor guys. So in, to this end, we need to check what is the relation between this random variable and, and random variable up to time n minus one. So what is xn stop at the t? And what is uh, random variable stopped at uh, t of n minus one? So we write out expl uh, explicitly. This is n sub t. This is x n minus one sub t. So the difference between these two random variable is on only happens when t is n. So if t is less than um, n minus one, then they are the same. And if t is equals n, then they are different. And for t is greater than n, then they are, uh, the one is n, and then the other is will st uh, stay at n minus one then. So if t is less than n minus one, they are the same. So for t less than n minus one, it is just like psi. T equals I. For this part, they are the same. And then for T equals N, it equals XN, T greater than N minus one. And for this part, it equals XN minus one t greater than n minus one. Okay, so this is the relation between these two random variable. For the first part, when t is smaller than n minus one, they are the same. And when t is greater than n minus one, then one is xn and another one is xn minus one. This is the only difference. we can check what is the conditional expectation. So for x and t, we write it in two parts. So now look at the first part. For the first part, this guy is containing fi. This is containing fi. So the product is containing fi. And i is less than minus 1. So the whole summation here is containing fn minus 1. So the first part is just, uh, when we calculate the conditional expectation, we can just put them out. And we only need to check what is the second part. For the second part, we know that t greater than n minus one is contained in f n minus one. So we can take out this is known. We can take out it. So taking out what is known. So this is taking out what is known. And then since xn is a martingale, we know that this part equals xn minus one because xn is a martingale. So this, then we compare this uh, relation here. This is exactly the same as t n minus one. Okay, so this is the truncated martingale at a stopping time, and it is again a still Martin, uh, it is still a martingale. And then we turn to the last theorem of today's lecture, optional stopping theorem.
Okay, so suppose that we have a martingale, a sequence of random variable x n. It is this is a martingale, and then we know that the expectation, the sequence of expectation is a constant. This is true for martingale, and now we also show that if we truncate this martingale at a stopping time, then the new martingale, then the new process is still martingale, and then the question is whether I can change this n to the stopping time. So the rough idea is this should be true because this xt is just a smart martingale up to some random time. And then the expectation should be still the same as, the, as this sequence. And the optional stopping theorem give us four criteria to check when this relation is true. So our goal is to check whether we can change this fixed index, fixed in, uh, integer n by a stopping time. So this is the idea of optional stopping theorem. The optional stopping theorem gives us four criteria to check to check uh, whether this is true. The first criteria is for any stopping time t, so for any stopping time t, for the truncated process, we have that the expectation is still the, is, is, is the same as the constant sequence. Okay, this is true because we already showed that this process is still a martingale. Since it is a martingale, we know that for this martingale at time n, it has the same law, it has the same expectation of the initial value, and for the initial value, it is the same as x0. And then by definition, this left hand side is just x n sub t. So the first criteria is true, and we already prove it, because this truncated process is also a martingale. The second criteria says, if we have two bounded stopping time, so this condition is important, so if we have two bounded stopping time, then this relation is also true. Uh, so, if our stopping time t is bounded, then this relation is also true. And in fact, we can prove a slightly stronger con con conclusion. So the slightly stronger is, if we have a smaller stopping time, then in fact we have this relation. So this is what happens for martingale if s and t are just the fixed integers. And now if we change them as two bounded stopping time, this relation is still true. And of course this implies what, what, what I wrote before. If we take expectation to both sides, then the, then the expectation of xt equals the expectation of xs. And if we just set s equals zero, it, is the, it implies what I said before. So this is the second criteria. The third one is, if this sequence is, uh, is, is dominated by a random variable. So if, this sequence is dominated by a random variable y, then we also have this relation. And the fourth, criteria is for this sequence of random variable, it has bounded increments. So the increments of the sequence is bounded by a constant. And the expectation of this stopping time is finite. Then we still have this relation. So before we prove all these criteria, 
I will explain a few words why this is not always true. So for a martingale, so if we have a martingale axiom, we know that the expectation of axiom is a constant. And then we want to replace this n by a stopping time and check whether we still have this equality. But, but the, Jaffa, the first idea is, of course this is true because this t is a stopping time. We just replace it by something and it's not far from a time n. But in fact, this is not always true for any random variable. So if we have a sequence of random variable uh, of a sequence of stopping time, suppose that of uh, x0 satisfies certain law. And if we define our t as the first time that xn equals 0, of course, this is a stopping time. And we also have that xt is 0, because this is how t is defined. Then, of course, the expectation is 0. So, if we define the stopping time in this way, then the expectation of xt is always zero. And if we define another stopping time, it is the first time that this random variable equals one. Then of course this xt is always equals one, and the, and the expectation is always one. So of course they are not the same. So this, this relation can't be true for any stopping time. There should be some restrictions to the stopping time. And this optional stopping theorem tell us we have four uh, restrictions. If we can check any one of them, then we can say that the expectation is the same as the constant. So just a, a quick remark, this relation doesn't hold forever. Okay, and then we prove uh, optional stopping theorem. So the first one is already proved because we checked, we have already proved that this sequence is a martingale. And since it is a martingale, we know that the expectation of n sub t equals the expectation of x zero. And for second, so it is says that if we have two bounded stopping time, then we have the relation here. So since they are bounded, we, I assume that n is bounded by some fixed number n. So fixed. And the first step, I will show that So first step, I will show that Given, uh, if we calculate the conditional expectation of xn, given what happens up to time stop, up to time t, so t now is a stopping time, then it's the same as xt. So if t is a fixed integer, we already know this is true by martingale property. And first I will show that if we replace this fixed integer by a random stopping time, then this is still true. So why this is true? So now we want to show that this conditional expectation equals something. And we only need to check this xt satisfies the two properties for conditional expectation. So first, xt is ft measurable. We already know this, so it is stated in the previous page. Second, we need to show that for any event A, In Ft, we have so we need to check this second condition. So for any event A in Ft, we have this relation. This is the second condition for conditional expectation.
So now let us check what is the left hand side and what's the right hand side. So A is contained in FT. And the definition for FT is, OK, so now first let's check what is the left hand side. For the left hand side, X and indicator of A. And now we decompose according to what happens to the stopping time. So here I've done nothing, just a decompose of the expectation according to what happens to the stopping time. And since A is containing FT, we know that the intersection of A and T equals I is containing FI. This is the definition for FT. So from definition in FT, so since, since A is containing FT, we know that T intersect of T, uh, A intersect of T equals I can, is containing FI. So now I put the summation outside. And then I take conditional expectation according to FI. So by tower law, so in fact I have done nothing, just to first take a condition expectation of F, uh, with respect to FI and then take expectation. It is the same as taking expectation directly. And for this part, we know that this guy is containing FI. So we can take out what is known. So taking out what is known, So here, I, we take out what is known. And then since xn is a martingale, we know that this part equals xi. So now let me rewrite, so put the summation inside again. So this is what I obtained. And now this is exactly the same as expectation 1a of xt. So this shows that xt, it is the condition expectation of x and given ft. So this is the first step. Second step, I will complete the proof of the theorem. So we will continue to prove second. And now what we already know that by first step, we know that for xn, calculate the condition expectation of ft, it equals xt almost surely. And now, and what we want to prove is xt given fs equals xs. So what is xt given fs? We know that xt is the conditional expectation of xn given ft. Okay, so here we just replace xt by this conditional expectation. And now since we know that 
S happens before T, so Fs is containing Ft. So by tower law, tower property, we know that, so this one is smaller, and this one is bigger, and if we take twice the conditional expectation, it equals once uh, conditional expectation with respect to the smaller one. And then again, we repeat the same proof by the first step. This equals xs. Okay, so this proved the second item. And I won't uh, prove, the, so the proof of the third and fourth item are left as exercises, and you can check the proof in my lecture notes. So I highly recommend that you re, you uh, reprove all the details of the theorem by yourself and the check what happens. What, check whether it is the same as the one in the lecture notes, and if it is not the same, you have to figure out whether both of them are right or someone is wrong. Okay, so this is the optional stopping theorem. First says if we stop. Uh, this process at a stopping time, then the expectation is the same. The second says, in fact, it is just to tell us if a stopping time t is bounded, then this relation is also true. And the third item tells us if the sequence is dominated by a universal random variable y, then this relation is also true. And the third one says, if we have bounded increments, and a stopping time has finite expectation, then this is also true. And here, just a quick remark of what happens here. So in fact, for here, why this is not true in this case is because either, so in fact, we don't know whether this T, this big T has, we, we, we can't check, so it is impossible that both of the stopping time satisfies the criteria here. So for example, if we want to show that this one is the same as the expectation of x0, then this t say it has it should have finite expectation. And in the same case, if that is true, then this guy can't have finite expectation. So they both they can't they, this is impossible that both of them satisfy the conditions here. So this tells us why the expectation is not always the constant, the same constant. Okay. So just a quick example of what happens to Gambler's ruin. Okay, so this is the Gambler's ruin. So this is exactly uh, the, same as, the same page as we saw in the first lecture. So the Gambler's situation is we start from some initial money in purse. At each step, we gain $1 or lose $1 with equal probability. And Tau is the first time that we hit zero or begin. And first of all, this tau is the stopping time by the definition of today's lecture. And this is this theorem tells us the probability of we win the game and how long will it will take us to win the game. And if you still remember how we proved in the first lecture, we use some harmonic function and compare the, the function of the neighbor values. And today, after we learned the optional stopping theorem, we can give a new proof for this theorem. So for this gambler's ruin, first, we already see that this Xn is a martingale. And tau is a stopping time. And since it is a martingale and tau is a stopping time, and we, we can see that the truncated process, it is bounded because we stop it when it's zero or big N. So this guy is bounded. And since this is bounded, we can apply, uh, so we can apply the third item. So because it is, we can use a dominated conversion theorem. So we can use the third item here. So now we can apply, uh, no, where is it? 
OK, so now we can apply optional stopping theorem to this Martingale XN. And what do we have is the expectation of x tau equals the expectation of the initial value. And we know that the effect for the initial value it equals k. And for the left hand side, we know that x tau is either 0 or big N. So the left hand side equals big N times the probability that we win the game. And from here we see that the probability to win the game is k over n. And we can also give a proof for the second part. So the claim is we can check that xn squared minus n is also a martingale. So this will be discussed in the next uh, recitation. So this one is also a martingale. And for this martingale, it satisfies the first, the fourth. It satisfies the fourth item here. So it, is, it satisfies the fourth condition here. And again, then we can apply optional stopping theorem to this new martingale. And for this new martingale, what we have is For this new Martin, we'll apply optional stopping theorem to this new martingale. This is what we obtain. For the right hand side, it equals k squared. And for the left hand side, so x tau is either 0 or big n. So it equals that n squared times the probability of x tau equals n, and minus the expectation of x tau. And from the first part of the conclusion, we know that this probability equals k over n. So we rearrange this relation here. What we have is the expectation of this stopping time equals nk minus k squared. And this is, exact, uh, this is the same as what we have in the first lecture. So now just to give a new proof by Martingale language, by optional stopping theorem to show these two conclusions. OK, so here, this is the optional stopping time for Martingale. So if we have these four conditions, then we have that the expectation of xt equals x0. And now if we change Martingale to super Martingale, the only difference is we change all the equal sign by less sign. So that's still the same. You can repeat exactly the same proof. So if we change martingale by a super martingale, then all the relation here, so the equal sign will be changed by the less sign. But there's one more uh, criteria that is that is only it, that only happens to super martingale is not that doesn't hold generally is so the last item. If we have a non-negative super martingale. then we have the same conclusion. So for the previous four items, in order to have this kind of relation, we need to compose some condition on this stopping time. So either this stopping time is bounded, or the random variable has is bounded, or the random variable has finite increments. And the fifth item says, if we just assume that the random variable is non-negative, then we still have the same conclusion. And this is due to the Fatos lemma. So if Xn is non-negative super martingale, then we have the same conclusion. OK, a quick proof. So uh, this is not difficult. So by Fadus lemma, C 
So of course, xt is the limit of x n sub t. And by Fadu's lemma, so this is Fadu's lemma, we know that we can take out the limit if. Okay, so here, since we apply Fadu's lemma, this is where we use that it's a sequence of random variables, no negative. And after we take limit inf, let us check what's the condition expectation here. So by the first item, we know that this guy is less than the, the expectation of x0. So the limit inf is less than the expectation of x0. So this proves the fifth, uh, fifth item. So this is the only difference from the previous four criteria. So in the previous four criteria, either we need to assume t is bounded, or we assume random variable is bounded, or we assume the random variable has bounded the increments. And the fifth one, we assume that it has to be no negative. OK, so I will stop my lecture here. And in the next lecture, we will continue with convergence of martingales. So be sure that you will understand everything for today, because next lecture will highly depend on what we learned today. <laughs>